Yeah, you know the feeling. You've been invited to your friend's house for a game night to try a game that they've been raving about for weeks. The Kickstarter exceeded its goal by 30 times over, and you hated it. And you can tell by the smile on everybody else's faces that it seemed to strike a chord with everyone but you. So you're preparing your response for that inevitable question, what did you think? That was awesome. I really enjoyed being invited over. And how much more difficult is it when a game is immensely popular and it seems like everyone likes it except you? Or let's be real, what about when you're watching a reviewer and the reviewer claims that the game is spectacular? Well, still, how do you know if a game is really for you? Also, I don't know about you, but I look at Board Game Geek's top 100 games of all time. Board Game Geek, the largest and most popular board game rating site on the internet, the top 100 games, and at least half of them don't really land for me. They're not bad, but like, I wouldn't consider buying them. How do I find a game that I would really like? There are some solutions for this problem. For example, with time and experience, you'll eventually learn the characteristics of games that you tend to really enjoy. For me, I really like the dice worker placement mechanic. So when a lot of hype came out about the White Castle right before Essen, I kind of thought that this would be a game that I would still really enjoy, and I do enjoy it. Not only that, but we look to reviewers, and as we get to know different reviewers and voices on the internet, we come to identify those whose tastes we are very much in tune with. For me, Tom Vassell is that, and when I got into the hobby in 2010, he was like my guide to finding new games. But this is insufficient, because even though I like dice worker placement games, doesn't mean I like dice worker placement games just because of the mechanic. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Rajas of the Ganges. And our favorite reviewers sadly don't cover every game that we're interested in. What I want, what I have been looking for, and what I would love the community to agree upon is a concrete and objective way of describing games that doesn't depend on one's opinions, but on the features, and qualities of a Pause game. Here. At this point, I'd like to interject something. For those of you who are familiar with the channel, you're probably thinking, this is the part where I introduced the perfect board game formula. Except I'm not, because even though it was a system that I devised to describe board games, I made two mistakes with it. One, it wasn't very intuitive. People didn't understand what I was talking about when I rated theme and mechanics. And two, I used a 10 point system to rate these attributes and a system like that lends itself to this expectation that these are going to be opinions or my preference about these games when that wasn't the goal. I still want something like that, but something objective and something that makes more sense. So with that context in mind, let's continue the video. Oh. And while I have your attention, if this is a project you're interested in, maybe consider becoming a patron. Thanks. Now, let's resume. Now, there already exists an objective and widely accepted metric for measuring one quality of board games. This is something that is so conventional, we almost take it for granted. Some board game manufacturers actually print it on their board game boxes, and it's a measure of a game's complexity. You can actually say something like, Rhino Hero was a lot of fun. Um, thank you for showing it to me. I, I think I probably wouldn't buy it. I generally like games that are a little bit more complex. Or you could say, uh, It was a lot of rules. I gotta admit, I felt lost most of the time. I, I think this level of complexity really isn't for me. And this is perfect. When it comes to complexity, it's an objective way that you can describe how you feel about a game that is agreeable to everyone. It's because it doesn't say something about the game, it says something about you. Now, complexity is the most widely accepted, intuitive, and familiar metric for measuring games, but it's not the only one. In fact, some board game publishers have their own metrics and they actually print them on their board games. However, for the hobby at large, they're still lacking a vocabulary to describe games objectively. But in my opinion, there are five elements. Complexity is one of those elements and probably the most conventional. So I'll start 
my focus on the one that is probably the most loaded, but also the most needed. And that is the motivation behind a game's design. This is probably best understood by looking at two extremes. On one end, we have games that are motivated by their mechanics, or what you're doing when you play the game, and at the other end are games that have thematic interests or a narrative that needs to be told, and all of the mechanics are designed to support this theme. Now to provide an example, I think we should best look at Wingspan, the game that I have provoked more people than any other because I dared to say that it has a low theme score. Now don't get me wrong, Wingspan has an undeniable theme. The various birds have different habitats, diets, and behaviors. The theme is there. However, the driving mechanic of Wingspan is action selection compounded by card effects. The objective, of course, is to use resources from cards to collect other cards to satisfy other objectives, but none of this is inspired by bird watching. This is a really, really fun mechanic, and bird watching and birds complement this game. And this is evidenced by how easy it is to extract just that core mechanic and retheme it in games like Earth or Gizmos or Raising Robots. So that is all I am saying about Wingspan. It is a game that is more mechanically motivated than thematically motivated, and you can see it because of what it is that drives the gameplay. But let's look at an example on the other extreme. Consider Redwood, which, by the way, is a game that I don't own, so we'll look at some of the Kickstarter promo trailer footage for it. But this is a game about wildlife photography. In this game, you move your photographer by using something like calipers, and you frame your shot by placing angles of various sizes on the environment decorated by plants and animals. This mechanic is clearly inspired by its theme. It is in fact so thematic that, that is the reason why I don't own this game, because it is so technically involved that I would rather go outside and actually take photographs of animals than, than go through the mechanics of the calipers and the framing of the shot and all of that stuff. I do think it's, I, oh my gosh, I think it's brilliant. I think it's amazing. But you can't retheme this game. You could retheme it into some other photography theme, but you can't make it about trains, for example. This is a thematically motivated game. That is the difference. But here's what I'm really saying. Notice that when I tell you that I don't own the game because it's essentially too thematic, I'm not actually saying anything bad about the game. I'm Rather, I'm telling you something about me. But it's not either or. It could be both. For example, consider the game Barrage. Barrage is a game that's about dams, and the driving mechanic of the game is blocking other players by preventing water flow getting to their dams. Now, the thing about this game is, I, I honestly can't tell whether this game was motivated by its mechanic or its theme, because it it still rings with all of the characteristics of a true Euro game, which Euro games are usually heavily driven by mechanics, and yet the theme is, is perfectly integrated. I would say that this game is balanced. The next element of game design is something that I think we all recognize, we just don't often use this to describe games, but it would be the degree of a game's interaction. A game could either be very involved or it could be isolated. Isolated games, these are games like Roll and Rights, Flip and Rights, uh, Next Stop London, Karuba, Draft and Write Records, they all fall way down over here. Sometimes there may be just a little bit of involvement because you're competing for first place to achieve an objective or something, but other than that, it's people playing alongside each other. At the other extreme are games where interaction is the mechanic of the game. Games that involve negotiation or social deduction, like Avalon or even Catan. And then I think a lot of Euros fall somewhere in the middle with varying degrees of interaction on either side. The next element is artistry. Now, previously I used to call this components, and I tried to say that this was an objective quality of the game, but wouldn't good components be a good thing and a low score for components always be a bad game. Somebody pointed that out and I realized, yeah, rating components doesn't really work, but artistry I think ranges from two extremes. There are extravagant games, games that go above and beyond with their components, and then there is another 
extreme in this art form, which is games that are restrained, games that have minimized. And I think there's actually a beauty to that. But point being, there is an entire gradient and all of it is beautiful in its own sense. More importantly, it appeals to a person in a very personal way. Finally, there is the element of strategy, which varies from games that are pure skill to games that are pure luck. So at the very far end, you have games that are entirely luck, like Bingo or Candyland. And then just one notch up from that are games that are all about luck, but have a strategy that can be played predictably. So games like Cribbage or Blackjack or Yahtzee, these are games that you will certainly lose if you don't play a strategy at all, but the strategy could be calculated. And then the other end are games that are pure strategy, games like Go or Chess. And games like this can sometimes be inaccessible to people or unappealing to people just because it's a competition of who is the more skilled. Whereas the nice thing about Euro games, one notch back, is that just by adding some degree of luck, maybe a little roll of dice or some cards, you can get a game where the outcome is unknown and even a less experienced player has a chance. These are games where everybody can have some fun because it's not just about winning or losing, but rather the game in getting to the end playing to be efficient, playing the best game that you can, despite possibly not having the best skill. So those are the five elements. The motivation behind a game's design, degree of interaction, artistry, strategy, and of course, complexity. While I may have five elements, that's still not enough. I mean, a game's mechanics, its player count, its duration, these are all relevant when determining whether or not you like a game. However, I don't think the value of a reviewer comes from describing those things. You can identify those characteristics just by looking at the back of the box. However, with these five elements, it does allow us to use them in combination with each other to accomplish the thing that we set out to do at the beginning of this video, to tell an angry mob that we don't like a game. So for an example, and for my angry mob, here's what I think is the real issue with Wingspan. This is a more isolated game, which is fine. I don't mind isolated games every now and then. However, for its depth of strategy, it doesn't have enough skill involved in order to really engage me and justify the game's duration. And I actually think that if it had more luck, it would help things move along a little quicker. Additionally, the game is complex enough that it takes additional time to get the game on the table. That altogether is a combination that isn't so effective for me. So, if hearing games described like that is something that you're interested in, that is what this channel is all about. And I have many more videos to come. But that's not all. I also have an accompanying web app that has all of this data recorded with user ratings. So you can get on there, find your favorite game, and rate them according to how you think they would fairly be evaluated. And then lastly, if you really want to support this project, go ahead and check out my Patreon page. I alluded to that earlier, but if you go there, you'll find that there are benefits with the Discord channel where we're talking together about how games should be described and sharing our game experiences, as well as more exclusive content. Thank you again for watching. I hope you found this video useful, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.